Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert coming to you from Caracas, Venezuela. Intellectual property rights is a fairly obscure issue, but one that is central to the development of an economy. Uh, this intellectual property can involve pharmaceuticals, technology, software, genetically modified organisms, or other kinds of intellectual productions. The issue is often framed as one of ensuring le a legal framework that incentivizes innovation versus ensuring that intellectual work is disseminated throughout the economy and that it thereby supports economic development. Now, a recent study authored by the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz the co and also the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, uh, Dean Baker, as well as Arjun Jayadev, looks at this issue as it applies to developing countries. We are joined to, today by one of the um, study's authors, Dean Baker. Thanks for joining us, Dean. Thanks for having me on. So let's start with this uh, paper just briefly, just to look at it, and then we'll look at some more uh, current issues relating to it. So your paper begins with an analysis of what is problematic with the uh, existing intellectual property regime for developing countries of the North. Uh, that is, even though they developed the system in their interest, uh, many people are finding that the system is breaking down and not exactly helping innovation anymore. Can you just uh, give us a brief summary of what are some of the main problems with the system as it exists today? Well, first off, you know, this again, it's written from the standpoint of the developing countries, and there's been a big effort in trade deals really dating back at least to NAFTA, if not further, to impose longer and stronger patent, copyright, and related protections on the developing world. And basically what this means is a lot of money going from poor countries to rich countries, because it doesn't cost a lot of money in almost all cases to get, say, a drug produced, to get uh, things transferred over the Internet, it's basically free. Um, there's a wide range of items that they could get for little or no cost, which we're trying to make very expensive for them by saying we have patent rights, we have copyrights, other types of intellectual property that they have to pay us for. So basically, intellectual property in these trade deals is about transferring money from poor countries to rich countries, often at the expense of their health, since one of the biggest areas, of course, is, is prescription drugs. And there you often have ratios of 100, even 1,000 to 1, where drugs that could be produced at generics for, you know, two, $300 for a year's treatment could sell for over $100,000 when you have a patent-protected product. So we think that's a very bad idea for them just to wholesale transfer the regime of intellectual property that we've developed in the United States and West Europe to the developing world. So uh, the New York Times actually just recently had an article in which they were complaining about uh, China's uh, violation of intellectual property, which is an issue that keeps coming up over and over again. Uh, you responded to this recently in a blog post of your own. What are, what are some of the issues involved in that? What's the problem with uh, complaining about China in this regard? Well, there's two issues here. One of the things that most immediately upset me was just that the numbers they were using are just blatant lies. And I know no reason to use any other term. It, it, they're lies. They said that we're losing 600 billion a year due to intellectual property theft. And to put that in some perspective, that's more than a quarter of all of our exports. That's almost 40% of annual after-tax corporate profits. That's just an astounding number. And they give no source for it. I, you know, I don't know where exactly they got this number. I've seen past numbers calculated like that, where they say, imagine that every unauthorized copy of Windows was sold at the US price, or imagine every drug, a generic version, where we claim a patent right that was sold in India or other developing countries was sold at its US retail price. I mean, these are nonsense numbers. And it's just absurd that this would be a basis for the debate. And the New York Times has pretenses of being serious. It's outrageous they would allow that. But the deeper issue, you know, OK, fine, we're going to assert intellectual property rights with China. Obviously, China doesn't want to pay us more for our patent claims or copyright claims. The point I would make about that is we have to decide what we're going to go to bat against China over. And we could go to bat over currency values and try and protect manufacturing jobs. Well, people who do that are ridiculed in places like the New York Times. But instead, when we go, oh, we're going to go to bat for Microsoft and their copyrights on Windows, we're going to go back to Pfizer and its, its patents on drugs. Well, that's really good and important. And I'm sorry, I find that pretty disgusting because it's bad for China. And I don't see any particular reason why we should use the government's resources to make Bill Gates even richer. 
And um, just returning to, to your study, I mean, one of the issues, of course, is that uh, I guess the New York Times is claiming that the uh, that, you know, this is just the property regime. I mean, of course, there's other issues behind it. But I mean, one of the basis of their claims is that this is the property regime that we live under, and therefore, they should stick to it. But what uh, alternatives are, th are there? Your study does talk about some uh, a, a reconfiguration, a possible reconfiguration, because the current regime actually doesn't work neither for the developed countries nor for the developed Developing countries. So, uh, what are some of the ideas that you develop? How could things work differently? Well, they already do work differently to some extent. And again, this is one of the incredible failures of our political debate that we don't even talk about this because this is a massive amount of money. I mean, let's take their six hundred billion dollars. How much do we ever discuss that comes to six hundred billion a year? I'll answer that for you. Nothing. Nothing. It's rare we even debate something that's one tenth that amount. So here's this number. Again, it's an invented number. It's an absurd number. But if anything like that were true, the, the, the idea that we're not debating this as a matter of policy is kind of incredible. But in terms of alternatives, one of the things, direct funding. Take a look at prescription drugs. We spend about $32 billion a year on biomedical research that goes through the National Institutes of Health. Now, most of that, not all of it, most of that's for more basic research. But why couldn't you double or triple that amount? and have it go for funding the development of drugs, the clinical testing, the, right through the FDA approval process, and then have all these new drugs available as generics. Um, another route, you know, because we talk about intellectual property for creative work, you know, movies, books, I understand those people have to and should be paid. Well, one of the things we do now is we have a, a tax exemption for artistic con contributions to charitable causes, which can include things like museums, operas, you know, in other words, supporting creative work. Suppose we, we made that more democratic. We had a tax credit, say $100 per person. We give it to the creative worker of our choice or an organization that supports creative workers. And everything that they do is in the public domain. No copyright. It's freely available over the internet. I mean, there's lots of things that we can do like this. We already do them to some extent. It's just a question of thinking about more systematically and try to find uh, you know, a better mechanism and, and to enlarge it. But again, unfortunately, we're not having that discussion. Well, there seems to be, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but there seems to be uh, already, uh, well, you kind of suggested it, but there's already uh, movements that are out there that are undermining, so to speak, the existing intellectual poverty regime. Uh, particularly, I'm thinking of the whole Creative Commons licensing system and the whole free software system. Do you see that as perhaps a part of this way to go, that that might uh, uh, help change the regime, even though we're not publicly debating it, but uh, so to speak, by stealth means uh, undermining uh, the existing regime through these other uh, systems, Creative Commons and free software. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the point is, it's harder to enforce copyrights in the internet age. And, you know, the analogy I like to make, if you think back to the Soviet Union, their system of central planning, well, they had a black market there. They tried to outlaw it. You, you'd get arrested for selling blue jeans on the street, but people sold blue jeans on the street because there's a lot of money in it. And it's the same sort of thing here. We're like the Soviet Union insisting, oh, we have copyrights. Oh, we have patents. But, you know, people are ignoring them. It's very difficult. That's why we have such great efforts to try to enforce copyright on, on the web. And we have more punitive measures. And we're trying to make third parties, you know. So I, I'm responsible on my website to make sure someone doesn't post copyright protected material. Well, I really don't want to work for Time Warner. You know, that should be their problem. Why is it my problem? But the law says it's my problem. Um, in the case of generic drugs, when you have uh, these cancer drugs here that, you know, they're patent protected and they're selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're generic versions available in India for a few hundred, it's pretty hard to keep those cheap generics away from the people who need them here in other countries. So, yeah, I mean, I think the system is going to be undermined. It will fall of its own weight, but we should be having the discussion. And I uh, it is a legitimate concern in the sense we do need incentives for innovation. So we should be talking about that and thinking of better, more modern structures than the patent and copyright system. I mean, one more place where some debate is happening, but it seems to be mostly secret, is in the TRIPS treaties. Uh, that is the trade-related intellectual property and services, I think. I can't remember the full title. But anyway, the... Um, what, what, where do you see that, that going? I mean, what, what are the latest developments there that, that we know of? Well, there is growing effort. I mean, drugs are a central theme here because drugs obviously are directly related to people's health. 
And there is a growing effort, certainly coming largely from the developing world, but aid organizations as well, to try and push back on efforts to impose uh, patents and related protections on prescription drugs. And there you've actually had a explicit statements. Uh, the UN uh, came out with a statement, and there was an even uh, statement approved by the Group of 20 saying that we should be looking to alternative mechanisms that delink the funding of the research from the price of the drug. The U.S. always resists that. I mean, we, you know, this was even under Obama, so this isn't a blame Trump story. This has been both parties have been opposed to that. But the logic of it is very compelling. You even had the, the head of GlaxoSmithKline. He's now the former head, but while he was still head of GlaxoSmithKline, he said that we have to look to delink drug prices from the, the research and development costs. Because it, it literally makes no sense. I mean, no one in their right mind would say, okay, it's expensive to develop these drugs. How are we going to pay for it? Well, after we've developed it, the people who are sick and dying of cancer and other horrible diseases, we're going to make them pay. I mean, that's close to nuts. Okay, well, thanks so much, Dean, uh, for talking to us about this important issue today. Thanks for having me on. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.